I want to talk a little bit about my uh, personal history. I don't think I've ever talked about this on a video on YouTube before. Um, I was actually born in the state of Texas, but a year when I was a one year old, we moved to Holland. And because my dad worked for Shell Oil Company and we uh, lived in Holland for a year, I was really too young to remember any of that. But my sister was born in Holland, my sis younger sister, a year younger than I am. And I have another brother and an older sister. And um, they, while we lived in Holland, they actually learned to speak Dutch and everything. But I don't think they remember it since we've been back. And they, you know, they don't get the practice. And we, when we came back, we actually moved to California. And so I went to school and everything in, in uh, Concord, California, uh, Ignatio Valley High School, actually, is the name of it, where I, the high school I went to. And I graduated high school there. And then my dad was transferred. He worked in Emeryville, and it's close to Berkeley, California, back then. And uh, they closed that down due to a lot of, um, I think they had a lot of strikes. On, he was an uh, um, instrument engineer. And he didn't, you know, but the people, the other workers went on strike a lot. And they had a lot of trouble with personnel problems. And so they, Shell just closed the Emory plant down and transferred the people they wanted to keep basically back to Houston then. And so we came back to Houston. I'm trying to think of the year. I think it was around 1973, 72 or 73, the, the year I graduated from high school. Because I, I actually didn't attend my graduation because my dad got transferred and, and I had no reason to stay in California. So I moved back with them and my graduation happened when we were actually moving and so I never got to attend my graduation. They mailed my diploma to me, but um, so we um, came back to Houston. Actually, I, and as I said before, I was born in, the, in a Herman Hospital in Houston, so I'm a, I guess I can say I'm a native Texan but uh, I actually grew up in California in the Bay Area. And um, my real first job that I ever had, I guess you might say after high school, was working at a Palais Royal store and I just received um, stock and checked it in in their stock room and did various things around the store like that. And then uh, after about a year of working there, I decided I didn't care for that job too much and I quit the job to go on a sailboat race. Uh, in fact, I can remember my manager saying he couldn't believe I would quit, I just outright quit the job just to go on a sailboat race because um, I should actually go back a little bit in time. When we lived in California, my dad owned a sailboat and we sailed on the San Francisco Bay quite a bit and we sailed up and down the coast of California all the way into Baja, California in his boat and I, and I also sailed on other people's boats and during that time I, I uh, of course learned to sail and I, I learned a lot about boating industry and yachting being around it quite a bit when I was younger. So when I uh, got to Houston we also knew people that sailed here and, uh, and I wanted to go on the race and I just quit my job you know because it's like I, I didn't, I didn't care for the job and like I said my manager was kind of like I can't believe you're quitting the job just to go on a sailboat race but but that's exactly what I did and and when I came back I went to work for Gulf Coast Sailboats and at the time I worked for Gulf Coast Sailboats I when I was this was around I was around 18 years old then I graduated high school a little before I was 18 about 17 or so and um, I uh, worked for them doing, uh, well, in their mold shop, but I didn't, I, and I built boats, but I mostly did pattern making work, which was like uh, making the molds for the fiberglass components. We also ma made industrial fiberglass boxes and things to uh, mainly to house um, um, like um, safety equipment, things like that in the refineries around here in, in the Houston, Texas area. And uh, 
but while I was worked for them, the their family was big into offshore sailing and racing, and so I I would um, go on sailing races offshore with them, and I built. I was trying to think. I built at least three boats for them that they raced, if I remember right. And um, so I was kind of involved a lot with this yachting thing. And at the time as well, I designed a 32-foot sailboat when I was 18 years old. And I built it while I was working there at Gulf Coast Sailboats. I worked there probably about five years, I think. And um, right at the end of when I finished that boat and launched it, I met my wife and I got married. Um, well, maybe it was before that, because uh, we were married, yeah, I guess we were married before I actually launched the boat. But anyway, kind of hard to remember, because we've been married now 40 years, so if I'm 65, I must have been about 25, 24 or 25 years old, I think, in that age when I got married. And, uh, it was 1979 the year 1979 and um, then I had uh, I don't remember why I quit the job at the sailboat shop can't remember that exactly but but I did and I went to work for an instrument company in, in Angleton Texas and I predominantly for them I, I designed sheet metal enclosures uh, you know on the um, computer and things so I learned about using CAD software quite a bit and, and um, sheet metal work and various things like that. They, they made, they, the company was Amscore, they made gas and liquid chrom chromatographs for, uh, that also got put into, um, a lot of times into refineries and things like this for that. And I worked for them for a while, but uh, probably about three or four years. And then, uh, then after that, I just started working for myself, and ever since then, I've worked for myself. And uh, it started in the garage. I started with the, if you look at my shop tour video, I show some of the equipment I had in the garage that are, is still here at Centerline, over in the corner of the building over there. And uh, I did that. I, I worked in the garage probably for maybe a couple of years, and then I rented some space, and I bought, and, uh, but I also, at the same time, I got a job, or I didn't get a job, but I, I had my own shop with a partner, and that's after, uh, I don't know how many years, I can't recall exactly, but it started to not work out with this partnership thing, and so I, I basically walked away from that and, uh, and got a job at a machine shop here locally in Houston. It was, it's no longer in business, but it was called ESCO at that time. And I worked for them, and I ran a Bridgeport mill in the beginning, and then um, I ran a CNC uh, Herco knee mill with the Ultimax control for a while, and then, then I was kind of in charge of the um, CNC people, like the, like the lead guy, I guess you'd call me. And, uh, and I worked in the office, and we did predominantly work for um, NASA. With ESCO was a prime contractor for NASA in this area for the, their aerospace stuff, I guess. You know, and then, but also they did work, at what we called commercial work, which was for um, oil field type stuff, but not, not, not big oil field stuff. It was instrumentation type oil field stuff, almost like what I do now for myself here. Um, and it's more, this is more precision detailed work than the bigger stuff that you might think of like, like blowout preventers and oil field, you know, rigs, uh, drilling rigs and all that kind of stuff. And I worked on that for, um, I worked for them for quite a while, but at the same time I was running my own business. And then I had rented space and I bought, I actually, purchased one of their Herco knee mills when they uh, got rid of it and they got a new machine and I moved it into that space so I had, if you watch the shop tour, you'll see some of this equipment. I had the Mirando lathe, the Bridgeport mill, 
the Herco knee mill air compressor and, and, and various other stuff in the machine shop, grinders, drill press, whatever. And, um, and, we, uh, and I kind of got working with this guy that made gun parts, or guns, not only the parts but the guns, and we made a, a replica of a German Luger in stainless steel. And I did that for a while and, I, and we bought, at that time I bought, in the beginning, one um, her, um, Haas little uh, VF2 and I was in that building maybe a couple of years and then we moved into a larger building that, well actually, I didn't actually control the building, the, the guy that I was building the guns for controlled the building, if, if I want to put it that way. We weren't really partners because I didn't want to have a partner any, again, um, so we um, kind of moved into the building with him and he had his people that did certain things for the guns, but, but it related to building the guns and we built, I guess over a period of about four years, we built like 20, almost 25,000, 22, 25,000, I don't remember, of these guns. And so, I, but in reality, I, I don't really care for the people in the gun in, industry in general. Not, not, I don't have anything against certain people about that or anything against guns. I, I own one of these German Lugers myself, but I don't own any other guns. I'm not really that much into guns, except that I built them and we test fired them. I remember we used to go through like um, 4,000 rounds of uh, nine millimeter ammunition a week test firing guns. We built a firing range inside the building. The building was big enough so we could have a firing range to test fire. And they, the, the guy that was kind of working with me that actually rented the building, I just rented space from him in the building. He, he did the polishing work and various finishing type work. I just did the machine work. And during that period of time, about five, four more uh, Herco VF2s. I mean, not Herco, a uh, Haas VF2s. And um, I think about a, a closing, actually in the garage, I even skipped this, in the garage I had a closing Condia uh, CNC knee mill with a, a Dynapath 10 control, if I remember right, on it. And we bought another one of those as well when we were in the building, building the gun parts. So we had two, those two, uh, um, they were closing Condia mills with the Dynapath control, the, the Herco knee mill and ultimately five Haas VF2s and we were making the gun parts. And, um, but that, the guy with the gun business and the gun, and the gun people in general, uh, I don't really want to say anything bad about them really, but I just don't do that stuff anymore and I won't do anything that has to do with gun, gun work for gun manufacturers anymore because I, I just don't, like the way they do business but that kind of that that sort of it wasn't really a partnership but I was in his building and but it wasn't working out at one time and and uh, and I wanted to move out of the building but then he didn't want me to move out and he even obstructed me with marshals and I had to get lawyers and do all this stuff to get out of the building and 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 move over into this building that I'm in now and I and I started working with this other individual because he could get me the, the work for the oil field type work is what we did over here and still do over here. But it was a little bit difficult getting out of that building because of the situation and the legal issues and everything. And, and I even found that this person had bought machinery in my name and everything because I had the, I basically had the credit because I bought equipment, I paid for payments and everything but um, it was a weird situation I, I don't want to go into big detail about that but the thing is that I got out and, I, and we moved into this building and just in the corner of this building in the beginning in 1996 I believe it was and sort of my sort of business partner again I don't I don't learn the first time I guess was this guy that worked for spring engineers which is right next door to us right here and still is and um, but he had the contacts to get work with uh, back then with uh, Baker Atlas, I believe it was. Or, or no, 
Baker Atlas or something Atlas. Anyway, they're no longer they don't they, they no longer exist, and they melded into Baker Hughes. And uh, and this is like instrumentation, oil field instrumentation, which is basically the kind of work I do now here. And did that for. Um, and my wife and I ran the business for, I can't remember, we, up till 2005 is when we sold the business. I explained that a little bit in that shop tour video. And, and uh, then I, I um, moved over to a space I rented closer to my house over here. And it was a um, 6,000 square feet, I believe, space. and I. And I bought this uh, the Mitsubishi Horizontal Mill when I was over there. It was the first machine I, I actually bought and put over there. And then later I got the grinder and the CMM. And what else did I have over there? And, and some, you know, various small stuff. And I did work for uh, um, Varco Schaefer over there, predominantly for their R&D department. And, and that was going pretty good. And then the people that had purchased my business that are here, that own it still right now, wanted me to come back over here because they had a very specialized titanium piece um, to do. And, and uh, I, uh, they felt like I had the expertise to do it, but I, I, they had a, bought a bridge mill, this Toyota bridge mill over here to do it on. They wanted to set it up on that bridge mill which I did in the beginning, but I said, if I'm going to do the work, I'm going to do it on, on this Integrex machine, which is what I own now, because it's much better suited than that bridge mill to do the work. And so we made kind of a deal where I'd move back in here and I'd pay them rent. And this is actually my old shop, but I'm back here paying the owners, the new owners of it, rent to be in here and doing my... Uh, um, machine work on my machines for myself and I, I'm like a um, vendor I guess you would say to them even though I'm in their space I, I provide all my own tooling and, and everything the only thing I get from them is the space and I run on their air system and I and I actually am able to use their internet service and electricity of course and for that I get just this one lump charge a month for for that but other than that, I provide everything else I need to do my work. So that's kind of brings me all almost up to date here with my kind of personal history thing. That's kind of quick, but it, it gives you the idea of what I've kind of done. And the only reason I bring all this up is um, a lot of people ask a lot of financial questions about things like, you know, how do you figure this out or how do you figure that out and everything. And I was thinking about this and I was saying, you know, um, I actually, my wife and I learned this as we went, you know, because this is not something that you get taught. You can't, I don't, I don't care what you do, what school you go to, you can't really learn what, what we had to learn in a school. You have to learn as you do it. It's only, unless you could find somebody and be kind of like their, their, they could be kind of your mentor or then they would allow you to work at a place and learn as you go or maybe you could get a job like that, I don't know. But it's not something that school teaches you how to, how to uh, take care of these things. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say that you have to change your whole mindset. The, the mindset that, that society teaches you is to um, go to school, get an education, and then uh, with that education, get a job, and then you work at that career. And, and, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I don't disagree with that, but I think that you're, you're putting yourself in a position to where you, you're just um, stuck and you cannot, you cannot um, go beyond that position that society has, has sort of dictated to you what you're going to do or how you're going to be stuck. I, I hate to use the word stuck because I don't think it's necessarily a bad 
way to do things, but they teach you this and they teach you, well, take the, any extra money you have and invest in the stock market and, um, and build up savings and, and maybe buy a house and everything. But, but in reality, and this is going to sound a little bit conspiratorial, I guess, that this is what these people who control society, whoever they may be, you know, some people call them, you know, the shadow, the hidden government, the, the Bilderberg, the, the, you know, whatever. I don't know, you know, all these people, but this is exactly where they want you to be. And they programmed you from your early days in school because they control the school system, basically. And this is where they want you because they want these little worker bees to do their work for them. I know that sounds a little like paranoid conspiratorial, but, but I really believe this, that, that uh, in a way, um, nowadays getting an education and, and taking loans out and paying, I know there's people in my family that still owe money on student loans like 20, 30 years later. You know, they never get them paid for. And, and this is exactly where they want you to be. They want you to be, you know, be holding to them and, and working for what they need. And, not, and you'll never, you, you never break free or get further ahead than that, is, is the way I look at it. I, you know, this might be just, well, it sure is my opinion, but, but this is what I see, that if, if you um, work, for money, you'll be a slave to money. You have to change your way of thinking, I think, in order to, um, you know, I never visualized myself as a, this entrepreneur or anything. I just worked, I did what I knew how to do, and I learned as I went. And in the days when I first started working, you, if you went to a bank and you said, you know, I want to borrow money or I want to do this or that, or, or even, even people that lend money, and, you, and they ask you, well, well how do you, what's your occupation, how do you earn money, how do you intend to pay us back? See, that's what they want to know, of course. And, you, and if you say, if, if I said back then that I was an entrepreneur, they would look at me like, oh, so you, you mean you're unemployed. You know, that's, that's the, I had, I've had bankers tell me that, actually. I'm not making that up. You know, uh, oh, you're, you're uh, that's a fancy way of saying you're unemployed, basically. And, and in essence, you are. You don't have a paycheck. You don't depend on somebody else. You have to work, and you have to make it work. And this is a, this is a whole different way of thinking, and I think this is not taught to people in schools or anything, that they teach you, get an education, get a job, and you're going to be holding to an employer, so you're an employee. So the way you've got to reverse your way of thinking here a little bit, you've got to say, I'm not going to work for money because when you work for money you become the employee to the money or the slave to the money what you got to work for is to just get the work done and the money will come I, I know this sounds kind of backwards and myself I don't invest in the stock market I don't believe in investing and depending on what other people do this is just my way of doing things. I'm not saying it's the right way or a better way than anybody else's. I'm just saying this is my way. I depend on what I do, and so I invest in myself. Or, you know, there are other people that invest in things like real estate and whatever. But I, I don't, I don't, myself, I don't trust that stock market stuff. And I don't, and, and actually a good thing because a lot of people lost a lot of money a while back in the stock market. Now the stock market's doing good right now, but, but if you had your life savings in investments in the stock market and it went down, well then you lose everything because the money is, is not real. And this is the, the thought process you've got to start, well, I'm not saying you have to do it, but I, I'm just saying think about this. You have to work for your, um, satisfaction of doing the work and if you do a good job the money will come believe me I'm uh, I can put it no other way because this is exactly the way I work 
and, and uh, people ask, well, what about the price of that job and what about the price of the setups you do and the tooling? This is the reason I brought this all up to begin with anyway. Is, and and uh, once I agree to a price on a job, I never, I never think about, and I guess this is not, not exactly a perfect way to do things, but I never think about the cost of it from that, that point forward. I just do it, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, because I agreed to the price and I'm going to complete the job. If I, uh, if I thought too much about all that, for me, this is the way I do work, I, I, I would probably get too focused on the money. I don't want to worry about the money. I don't think about the money. I agreed to a price and, and, I, and I'm going to complete the job regardless of the cost to me for the job. But hopefully I agreed to a good price and I'll make money. This is, this is the way I do work, so I don't worry about it. I buy the tooling I need, I buy whatever I need, I make what I need, and I get the job done because I don't work for money. I don't, know, I don't know how to put it any other way, and, and I don't think about it that way. See, I, I work because I, I want to do the work, and I enjoy the work, and I still enjoy the work even after, um, oh, since I was 25, so 40 years or so of uh, doing it, and it interests me, and I like to learn things about doing it, but, but I don't work for the money. If you start working for the money, you become the slave to the money and you will never have money because you'll be worrying about it all the time. Um, at least that's my thoughts. So you got to kind of turn your way of thinking around here, I think, you know, and, and start thinking about how you do things. So if you, when you get money, and you will get money if you do a good job, people will come to you because there's so few people that actually do a good job. So if you do a good job and you put your best into your work, whatever it might be, I don't care if it's machine work or whatever kind of work, you will have people come to you looking for you. I don't, I don't go out and sell anything. I don't advertise. I don't do any of that. They come to me and if I don't like the job, I don't do it. You know, I can pick over the jobs I want to do even because I, I put my best effort into the jobs uh, as the way I, I can put it. So you will make some money, but you don't want to spend your money that you make on stuff that doesn't make you money. You see, those are, you got to have, you're, you're going to have two different things. You're going to have what you call assets and liabilities. And anything that costs you money is a liability, and you want to avoid that as much as possible. I haven't avoided that as good as I could, I'll admit that. And, and, uh, and, but you want to try to spend the, your money on things that make you money, like equipment or various things. And, you, and also this helps you not pay so much taxes when you um, have equipment to depreciate and everything. See, this is part of being an entrepreneur, I guess you might say. And I don't even consider myself even worthy of giving you advice on how to um, do business because I'm, I'm not that good of a business person. I'll admit that. My wife is like a thousand times better in, in, in the way of business and dealing with people and, and the financial aspects and everything because I don't want to worry about it. I don't want to worry about the money. All I want to do is do my work and, uh, and, and be happy and satisfied with that. And, and so I just wanted to say this that I think that people have their thinking reversed is the only way I can put it. And they should be thinking about their work and why they do their work and not be working for the money. Don't do that because you'll be the slave to your money if you do that. So anyway, I don't know if that means anything or is worth anything, but that's the way I do work. And so when you ask me about money, and wow, what's that cost and this and that. And for the most part, I do know certain parts of it, but I, but I don't pay too much attention to it, to tell you the truth. You know, I recorded those clips that you just saw um, the other day, and then I was trying to 
piece that together into maybe a video to post. And uh, I noticed that I, I left out a lot of information. I mean, there just wasn't really time in, uh, I don't know how long I talked there, maybe 30 minutes on those clips. And, and uh, there's so much more to this story and the way I think about dealing with money and things like that than I, you saw in those clips. And, and, but I don't know if this is content that's interesting to people that watch my uh, YouTube channel. You know, if it is, uh, let me know in the comments. And, and I, I noticed that, you know, I had kind of crappy light and, and this, and, and, and I'd like to make that a little better, maybe get a little bit better lighting in this corner in the building here. The light is really crummy. And, and so, I don't know, I, I don't have the proper stuff for that. But anyway, the video itself is, is easier to make than a machining video. I wouldn't stop making machining videos, of course, but this information might be interesting to people that are trying to pursue this kind of work or any kind of work in general and the way you think about things and, and the way you do things because it's kind of hard to learn this stuff um, because, as I said in the previous clips, I don't think society wants you to know it or they want you to, to teach you to know these things. And I just happened to learn it by accident, really. I, I didn't go about trying to learn it. But maybe what I went through in the last, you know, 50 or, you know, 40, 50 years might be of help to somebody. And they wouldn't have to stumble over things like I did, you know, and, and try and make, because you have to be prepared. You're going to make, and this is stuff I left out, you know, you're going to make many, many mistakes. But these mistakes are learning processes, and you've got to do them. There really is no way to avoid that. I can't say to you that you would start out and you wouldn't make any mistakes, because in reality, if you didn't, you really didn't learn anything. So you, you need these mistakes. To, to, it's a learning process to make them. And you should look at them that way. You're, you're going to fail. I, I, um, I failed like couple of times with certain businesses and people and relationships two or three times and and uh, these things happen and you've got to tell yourself I'm not going to give up on it you know it's too easy to give up and 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 uh, go back to what you were doing maybe or something like that in my personal life I never go back to what I did before if I can help it and I never have so far because I think that's a backwards movement and I don't want to do that. I want to move forward no matter what it takes. You got to make it work. See, these are, this is a different way of thinking, like I said earlier. You know, there always is a way to make something work. You just got to figure out the way to do it. So if this is interesting content, let me know in the comments.